Buongiorno, grazie di essere qua. Parliamo di lavoro di domenica e eh, il tema è eh, in qualche modo cercare di interpretare quello che è successo al concetto di lavoro e, al, e a numeri che descrivono quanto lavoro c'è, che lavoro c'è eh, dopo il 2008. Eh, è chiaro che su questo tema c'è eh, una sorta di nebbia, le vecchie eh, teorie come la curva di Phillips e altro non, non sembrano più funzionare, eh, ci domandiamo se c'è una disoccupazione tecnologica, ci domandiamo eh, com'è fatta l'Italia, perché l'Italia è diversa dagli altri paesi. Abbiamo visto la settimana scorsa un grande articolo dell'Economist che diceva fondamentalmente la questione del lavoro è sopravvalutata, c'è molto lavoro, si lavora un sacco, però qui dall'Italia non si vede così bene questo genere di fenomeno. Insomma abbiamo un sacco di problemi sul lavoro eh, eh, e sulla concettualizzazione delle teorie che ce lo spiegano. Eh, da questo punto di vista eh, l'incontro di oggi con Debbie Blanchflower, che è professore a uh, Dartmouth uh, College dal 2001 e che lavora uh, anche uh, molto a livello di divulgazione con uh, Bloomberg TV e altri, è fondamentalmente un uh, incontro per fare chiarezza su quello che ci dicono i fatti e i numeri relativi al lavoro, al sottoimpiego, alla gig economy come eh, si dice adesso, cioè quei lavoretti che si fanno sulle piattaforme, quanto sono importanti, se sono importanti per capire, vi ricordate l'anno scorso proprio qui al Festival dell'Economia è stato presentato il primo studio sulla gig economy, l'economia dei lavoretti che si fanno sulle piattaforme per portare a casa eh, il cibo dal ristorante o per, fare, per mettere a disposizione delle, delle, del, dei turisti una stanza vuota in casa con Airbnb eccetera e l'Inps ha presentato la prima ricerca eh, eh, qui proprio al Festival dell'Economia l'anno scorso portando alla luce il fatto che c'è almeno un milione e passa di persone in Italia che fanno uso di queste piattaforme per lavorare un po' alla settimana 4, 8, 12 ore a settimana. Anche questa è una forma diciamo, di sottoimpiego più o meno volontaria, come lo è il part time più o meno volontario, come lo sono le forme di lavoro nero più o meno volontario. Allora cercare di capire che cosa sta succedendo, come possiamo aggiornare le nostre teorie, la nostra visione del mondo intorno al eh, lavoro e ai numeri che lo descrivono, Uh, che poi eh, come tutto in Italia diventano sempre polemica noi abbiamo fatto di fatto scendere la disoccupazione voi avete fatto salire l'occupazione uh, questo genere di discorsi sono sempre uh, meno interessanti se non abbiamo in mente come interpretarli e quindi David Blanchflower ci aiuterà in questo abbiamo 40 minuti de di lezione del professore e poi il tempo per delle domande con il pubblico. Eh, mi raccomando non guardate il suo sito personale dell'università perché lì ci trovate soprattutto grandi pesci che lui pesca eh, nel tempo libero. A dopo. I'll speak slowly, I'll try. Um, so this is a talk about the new book that I have written. Um, it's basically been 30 years in, in the making, um, and it's about many countries, including Italy, and it's about um, the phenomenon of a changing labor market. Uh, I worked on this really for 25 years up to 2008, and everything that I knew up to then has actually changed. So 2008 has become something quite different. And the concern is that prior to 2008, policymakers, including me, I was at the, at the Bank of England voting on interest rates, um, basically missed the big one. They missed the Great Recession. 
And unfortunately, in the decades since then, we've seen a, a lot of errors and mistakes, um, particularly arguing right now in countries like Germany, the US, and the UK, um, that they're at full employment. And I'm going to show you that there were huge mistakes in the past, huge mistakes now, which has led to difficulties for workers. And ultimately, I'm going to show you that what happened in the labor market essentially explains right-wing populism. I can show you that it essentially explains votes for Le Pen, votes for Brexit, votes for, um, uh, for Trump, and, and, and elsewhere in Italy and, and other places. So the book's actually about the opposite of what we were talking about a moment ago. It's not about bad jobs. It's about why aren't there good jobs? Uh, and I started writing it, and I went to Gallup. You may have heard of Gallup, the world's biggest polling organization. And they say on their website, one of Gallup's most important discoveries is what the whole world wants is a good job. And in some sense, you might think all the stuff we've seen in the last five years or so is about the fact that decent jobs that pay well have basically disappeared, especially for people with lower levels of education. And the question is, why is that? Uh, and what are the consequences of that? And I think what I show in the book is that low earnings and the loss of high-paying jobs have led to feelings of instability, insecurity, and helplessness. And one of the big things I'm going to talk about is the spreading of hurt, the, spread the spreading of pain around the world. Um, and especially in the United States, we've seen, in fact, a huge rise in what I'll call uh, deaths of despair. Um, okay, so, so that's where I'm going. The slides I'm going to make available to people. Um, there's many more than I will actually talk to, but I think it would be quite, I'm happy to, for people to download them and take a look. So I'm going to talk particularly about the US and the UK and Germany, but I'm also going to talk about Italy too. The reason the US and the UK and Germany are particularly interesting is that they essentially have the same problems that Italy has, in many ways the same, but they have unemployment rates in the threes. Um, and they have the same issues, the same issues of populism, the same issues of low wage growth um, uh, as elsewhere. So the question is, well, why is that? Okay, so let's try and make a start. Um, this, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about has a lot of uh, technical papers to back it up. One of the things that I quite like, and I've probably, if you see there this thing called the National Institute of Economic Review, I quite like it because it's a, it's a journal where, unlike in most things in economics, you write a paper, you send it off to the journal, and five years later it gets published, which isn't much use, isn't much use for policy making. This is the only great journal in economics where you send it to them, they send it back to you, and three weeks later they publish it. Which is, I mean, it's, so it's really good, because these papers that I wrote then, they were quite useful for those three months today who would read them. So this has some benefit of timeliness. So here's where I want to start you going. And I think the world has missed this. So there are two great financial crises that have existed in the last 100 years. The Great Crash of 1929 was a financial crisis, and it led to the Great Depression. The Great Crash, the Great Recession, the Great Financial Crisis that I sat and watched at the Bank of England um, occurred 2007 and 8, and the world missed it. But the thing I would say to people is, but unlike the Great Crash and the Great Depression, in 2008, we'd already seen the Great Crash and the Great Depression and didn't learn from it. So I started to try and think about what did Keynes say? So most people know about Keynes's work in the, in the general theory written in the mid-30s. But I, I've used this quote, and every, I've done it to me again. Every time I read it, it sends a shiver down my spine. This was written by Keynes in 1931, just after the Great Crash. So the crash comes, the market crash f falls, and then he says, what's coming now, folks? And here's the quote, and I want you to think this is where we are. We're in the long, dragging conditions of semi-slump. For it's a possibility that the duration of the slump may be much more prolonged than most people are expecting. And much will be changed both in our ideas in our, and in our methods before we emerge. Not, of course, the duration of the acute phase of the slump, that's the crash, but that of the long, dragging conditions of semi-slump, or at least subnormal prosperity, which may be expected to succeed the acute phase. I think that's absolutely crucial. 
we went into a crash, which I'm going to talk about. We, we emerged from that crash by finding Keynes, putting stimulus in the economy, uh, and that was true in Europe, in America, in Britain, in Japan, around the world. And then around 2010, uh, austerity in many places kicked in, and I'm going to show you that was the worst, most terrible decision that was made, and we're all paying the consequences of it. In the UK, I would argue that Brexit is entirely a function of the decision of a government in the, in the spring of 2010 to impose austerity. Um, and, and so this, I think, is the background to what I'm going to talk about. The second most important part to this is actually policymakers understanding in these three countries, but particularly in the US and the UK, what constitutes full employment. Um, and uh, what we've seen is that as the unemployment rates in these countries have started to fall, central banks have said, ha-ha, all is fine, everybody's doing great, it's time to start raising rates, which is what happened in uh, the US in 2017 and 2018, which at the time I thought was a huge mistake. Well, it turns out that that was probably right, and I'll just talk about it. So the question in these societies, not true in Italy, but we certainly need to understand what's happening in the United States. We need to try and understand what full employment means. For the technically minded, what's the NERU? The NERU, it's called N-A-I-R-U. It's the full employment rate of unemployment. And as unemployment has moved from six to five to four, uh, central banks say, ha-ha, we're at full employment, time to crank on the, on the brakes, try to stop the economy. But the background to this actually, which people should read, in fact was a, story, was a paper written by William Beveridge. In 1943, Churchill said, we need to understand in the UK what's going to happen when the war's over. Go away and think about what full employment means. So Beveridge wrote this great, this great book in 1944, and I was actually fishing in Florida, and I tried to get this book, and I couldn't find it, and I went to Amazon, the wonderful Amazon, and I found, I'd never seen it before, I found the 1960 version of this, um, of this book. So I go to the 1960 version, and it turns out there's a great introduction I've never read before. And, and Beveridge says, in my book, I said that 3% unemployment was full employment. And when we got to that point, that's the point at which wages are going to take off. That's the full employment rate in an, in an economy. And he said, and I love this story, he said, well, I wrote this in 1944, and John Maynard Keynes wrote to me. It's not like, you know, you and I write, Keynes wrote to him. Keynes wrote to him and said, that's a really good idea, but I think it's too low. I think 3% too, but let's, you know, let's see how we do. So that was 1944, and the 1960 prologue, he says, well, now I can look at what happened and look at the numbers. So we can look at what happened. Well, it turns out 3% wasn't too low. Actually, the average from 1948 to 1960 was 1.5%. And once the economy got to about 1.5% unemployment, by the end of the 1950s, wages started to tick up. And the thesis in my book is that why everyone's hurting so much is actually full employment is probably when the unemployment rate's about 1, 1.5, one 2 or so. Um, and, and this is the explanation for weak wage growth. We have to think why around the world are wages so, so wage growth so weak. The answer probably is the world changed in 2008. People were hurt, they, they lost their pensions, they lost their jobs, they became, they, many places they lost their houses. So in 2008 things changed and my thesis in this book is that actually um, what we should be doing, I say put the pedal to the metal, keep the economy cranking. If you can, and in Italy the reason why there's high unemployment is there's not enough demand. Central banks have not put enough stimulus into the economy. Fiscal authorities are wrongly worried about non-existent inflation. So that's what I'm going to talk about. But put the pedal to the metal. Let's, let's get unemployment down. So my story was that in 2006, I went on the Bank of England, the, the, the central bank in, in, in England, and I watched as economies around, as the US and UK economy started to collapse. And basically, central banks missed it. And I gave a speech in 2008 where I said, my concern is that something horrible is going to happen. And something horrible did happen, but the concern around the world at the ECB and at the Bank of England and at the Fed is that if we have something horrible happening again, which I think is coming actually, is that there's very little ammunition left. So in 2008, interest rates in, in Europe and in the UK were around 5.5%. 
And you could cut them from five and a half to zero and even, and even lower, and you could do quantitative easing. So in 2008, I was worried about something horrible happening, and today I'm also worried about something horrible happening, uh, and I'm going to talk about it. So um, economists effect essentially miss, I say missed the big one. I'm going to show you some plots. They essentially missed the big one. And can I show you just that this chart is kind of important, because I'm going to end up saying this. I'll say it slowly. We didn't, we, did, we didn't know where we were, we didn't know where we'd been, and we didn't know where we were going. So the problem in economies is that if you get to what I'll call a turning point, it's very hard to know when you're there. And my suspicion is that today we're simply repeating what happened in 2008. So let, let me try and explain this. So I said in March 2008 something horrible was happening and that the economy was headed into recession. And I kept saying that from March and April and May and June 2008. And I kept saying, oh, the economy is, I'm sure, has gone into recession. So this is the chart where it's very hard to actually know where you are. And that's what the book, in fact, talks about. So can we see at the top left there that number 0.2? So in July, I made speeches saying, I'm sure the economy is going into recession. So this is the actual data that was published in July 2008. Turns out, I'll explain in a second, it turns out that the UK and Italy and the US, well, the UK and Italy and, uh, and France and Germany had actually been in recession since April. And the US had been in recession since December 2007. But the fact was nobody knew. But let, let me show you the problem here. So this number came out, it's called the first estimate. And estimates in economics, um, they take, it takes a time to get to all the information in. So they take an estimate, they take actual data, and lots of forecasting. So the first thing I see is plus 0.2, which threw me. It completely threw me. Well, then uh, in September, we had the failure of Lehman's. In 2008, we'll, uh, we actually had the failure of RBS. And we still had no actual data showing you that what had happened in Q2 2008. In October, we got estimates for the, for the third quarter, that minus 0.5. But it wasn't until July 2009 that we actually, the estimate started to actually go negative. So everyone sees there's, it's the same quarter, in July it's 0.2, then it gets revised to zero, then it gets to revise to minus 0.1, and today we know it's minus 0.7. We, we realized by the time we got to about January 2009 that the economy had gone into recession in Q3, but we didn't actually know, just so everyone gets this, we didn't know until July 2009 that the economy had gone into recession in, August, in April 2008. Should I say it again? We didn't know until July 2009, and I, re I mean by that two successive quarters of negative growth. So we didn't know until July 2009 that the economy had actually gone into recession. So to put that in context, if we were in a recession today, the likelihood is we probably wouldn't really know that for at least a year because it's very hard to work out turning points, especially turning points downwards. So here's, here's a forecast that I was part of. So this is where central banks were in August 2008. And let me just explain what this is. This is forecast. So I, I have to show you what errors people made and why we're in the trouble we're in, because we're doing the same thing now. So I'm going to show you what happens then. I'm going to tell you where we are now and, and tell you that they, they've got us in a big mess. So this green band is what do you think is going to happen to output? So this is the committee that I'm on, and it says output's going to drop a little bit, and then it's going to, and then it's going to pick up. And the reason there's a big wide green band to the right is because the further out you are, the harder it is to forecast. That's the first thing. Second thing is actually it turns out that we have to do what's called a backcast. Because, the, because I showed you about the revisions, we don't actually know what's happened to the past. So actually, we have, we have, if you like, backcast to the, to the left side. That gets narrower the further we go out. And the black line tells you that that's the actual data. So this forecast says three things. It says, we think the past is better than the actual data says, because the green line is above the black line. So we think the past is better than the data really says. We think the present is better than the data really says and we think there's going to be no recession. I say it again, we think the past 
is better. We think the actual data has got it wrong. The past is better than we thought. We think the data, the point two we just got, the data is actually better than that. And we think going forward there's going to be no recession. How did we do? <laughs> well, guess what? The past got revised down. The present got revised down horribly. And there was the mother of all recessions. We could, we could call it the father of all recessions, too. But here's what we actually got. That's what we actually got. Um, we got the past. This was the biggest recession in 100 years. Um, and there's a fa the most famous, it turns out, the most famous quote was actually from the Queen of England about the recession. And the Queen of England was actually had gone to the London School of Economics to open the new Department of Economics. And they said to her, Queen, this is this new Department of Economics. It's got 100 people, 100 economists working in it. And the Queen said, well, that's fine. But when there was all these 100 economists, why did they miss the Great Recession? And the chairman said to her, Queenie, they were working on something else. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so that wasn't good. So she, she won the business quote of the year with that one. Um, okay, but it turns out that there was lots of evidence around what I call in the book, I talk a lot about the economics of walking about. Go and talk to people. Talk to them about what they think, about what they think's going on. So in Europe, we publish every month a thing called the Economic Sentiment Index for every country. It's true of Italy and France and Germany and Britain. Well, it turns out these indices had actually got it right. They collapsed well before this. I'll just show you a little, a little series. I don't want you to worry about what these numbers are. All I want you to look at is this is reports from businesses. Bank of England had agents. They go out and talk to the business and they say, how you doing? Literally, kind of, how you doing? And they say, oh, we're doing okay. And they say, are you going to hire lots of people? And they go, nah. And so this is just a score. You know, it's not technical at all. It's just a score. And I've got, I think, a dozen there. And they say, well, tell me about what's happening to your retail sales. Tell me about what's happening to your output. Tell me about how good it is for hiring people. Tell me about your capacity. And basically, this is what the economists missed. It was clearly there in the data. And I'm going to show you something at the other end, of course, replies to today. Um, and what you see is that, um, and don't worry about the numbers. All you need to see is a bigger number's better, a smaller number's worse. So in every single case, and it's true in every single country, the, um, by, by around May 2008, I mean, that forecast was for August, but by about April, May, of 2008, in every country in Europe, in the United States and around the world, it was blindingly obvious from the data that this was really going to be bad. And the policymakers in the ECB and at the Bank of England and at the Fed and in the governments around missed the big one. This is the biggest recession in 100 years and they were completely clueless. I'm sorry to tell you, I haven't any confidence that actually we're in a good situation now. So let me keep and then what you ended up there, I put Italy in. I mean, Italy, of course, the big story here is that Italy, um, each of these countries has relatively weak growth since then, in very weak compared to every other recession. And, of course, Italy has had very weak recovery, much weaker than elsewhere, and that's why people are hurting, and that's why they're ser ser searching out uh, um, populist parties. I mean, yesterday in the polls in the UK for the first time, a Brexit party came top in the polls ahead of both the, Le the Labour Party and the Tory party. And this is driven by lack of growth, lack of good jobs. So now let me show you where we got to. I just want everyone, I mean, this is, I I'm an economist. I'm showing you that you shouldn't believe what economists are telling you. Look at this. So this is, the, I think this is really embarrassing. And I'm going to show you this is where we are now. So this is a forecast for productivity. I like giving you these graphs. They look all complicated, and they're not. So here's the deal. So recovery comes in 2000. Does this thing point? Can I get this thing to point? No, I guess it doesn't. OK. Well, maybe I can use the mouse. I can use the mouse. So here's recovery since 2009. So we have recovery. It gets to here. And it's true in many countries. So then what happens is you come in and you say, right, we found Keynes for 18 months. We don't like him anymore. Austerity. We're going to make the poor pay because it was their fault we had the Great Recession. So what we're going to do is we're going to put in austerity. So there's the day you put in austerity. And the red line is your forecast as to what's going to happen to output. OK. So now you get 20 different goes at it. And so every time you ever say what's going to happen to output, you say 
that's each time you get another go. So each of those lines is you get another go, right? Okay, so there's about 20 goes at it. And every single time basically say the same thing, right? But the black line along the bottom is the actual output. There's the actual answer, the black line, flat as a pancake. But every single time you say, well, I was wrong last time, but I must be right this time. And you say it every year for 10 years in a row that um, it's going to be like this, but it was like that. But it's going to be like this again, and it's going to be like this again, and it's going to be like this. So that's what central banks have been doing. And, that, and they say, don't worry, we've sold everything. You're all going to be fine. OK. So then, so then in 2017, they said, oh, we, we got this a bit wrong. So we'll, we'll change it a little bit, and we'll put the blue line in. So I stopped that in March 2017. And now my next slide, so obviously we got to March, they'd solved it. Productivity was going to rise, just like they said. So my next slide shows you the actual output, what happened. Each of the next three quarters have been negative. So not up, down. So that's what's called the productivity puzzle. And the, and the central banks around the world said, we've got to raise rates. We've got to make things tougher for people. Because productivity is about to take off. And they said it 20 times in a row, but it never did. OK, this is worrying, right? So let me show you something else, another, another crazy one. And this is exactly the true in the ECB. It's true at the Bank of England. It's true in the, um, the Fed in America. So this is the forecast for wage growth. So every, the big deal in all these countries, if you're on an unemployment rate of 3%, wages ought to be exploding, and they're not anywhere. So this is what the, all these central banks think. So let me just show you again. It looks technical. It's not. So what this is, so this is in 2014 Q1, you can make a forecast of what you think wage growth is going to be in 2014, and you get four goes at it. And there's the actual answer. So then in 2014 Q1, you get to have a go in 2015, and there's the actual answer. And basically, you do exactly the same as we just saw. What you do is you say, wage growth is going to be four. Oh, but it ended up as two. But don't worry, next time, it's going to be four. And it ends up as two. And you do it 21 times in a row. Because you always say, look, you say in 2014 Q1, it's, we think it's going to start out at two and three quarters. But it's going to be three and three quarters. And in fact, in May of this year, uh, sorry, in May of this year, the Bank of England made the same forecast, basically, as it did in 2014 Q1. So the answer is they always think it's going to be four, and it's always two, and it's never four. And they never change. Right? And so central banks say we've been tightening rates, and we're tightening up stuff, and we're, rate, and we're, not, we're not boosting the economy, because we just know that, that this is all going to happen. And of course, that's just, that's just nonsense. I'm just going to finish one thing here, and then I've got to try and get to think, think about populism. So here's the worry. Here's the worry. So the mistakes that were made in 2008, where you missed the Great Recession, and that hurt people terribly. So now you have this horrible slow recovery, and, you say, and the central banks say, everything's great. We're at full employment, and everyone's going to be doing just fine. So this is the Fed's forecast. This, this is the latest forecast we have from the Fed. Um, what's the music? Are we all right? Okay, let's keep going. This is the, this is the forecast from the Fed. This is the Federal Reserve the, in the United States. So the United States is very important to the world economy, not least because trade, the trade war is coming out of, the, out of Trump. But look, let's just look at this. So the current rate is 2.375%, basically. And this is um, the, 16, the 17 people on the Fed are asked... What do you think is going to happen to interest rates in 2019? And they say, well, four of them say it's going to rise by, a, by a 250 basis points. And two of them say it's going to rise again. So six people think rates are going to rise in 2019. And in fact, of the, of the 17, um, four of them think in 2020 rates are going to rise by a bit. And, and several of them think interest rates are going to rise like crazy. So. The bank's telling the markets, this is what we think is going to go on. We think we're at full employment. We've made all those forecasts. Well, very interesting, but nobody believes them. So can I show you? So everyone has in their head, the bank, the Fed says we're going to keep raising rates. And that caused Trump to go after them. Um, and Trump says, you shouldn't be doing that. Well, we can work out what the market thinks. Let me show you what the market thinks. And the problem with this chart is that this moves in real time. So I did this 
yesterday at noon, but it moves in real time because you can read out in the markets what the markets think. So can everybody see what I've got here? So if you, so there is not, and on those charts I just had a moment ago, not a single person of the 17 people on the committee who've been doing all these forecasts and missed the Great Recession, not a single person thinks there's going to be a rate cut. Does everyone see there's not a single person who's below that? I mean, there's no one below where I've shown you. There's nobody under 2.375. Well, look at where we are now. So let's just look at this. So, the, so if I give you the December 2019, that says there's a 5.9% chance that interest rates will be the same as they are now at their December meeting. 6% chance that interest rates will be even where they are now. So there's a 94% chance of an interest rate cut. Nobody on the Fed even thinks, they all think there's going to be rate rises, but the market doesn't believe a word of it because they listen to me. <laughs> and there's a 94% chance of uh, an interest rate cut. There's a 75% there's a, there's a chance of an interest rate cut in the October meeting. And by the time we get to January, there's a prospect that's built in here. Is there's, the market thinks there's a very real prospect that by the end of 2019, the Fed will have cut three times. So I gave it to you again. There's the disconnect. The Fed missed the Great Recession, missed everything a year in, had no idea that the Great Recession had come. Today it says all is well. The people don't think it's well, and the markets don't believe them. So that's a big problem. Um, and obviously, if you're at the ECB, you have a problem because you can't cut far. What are you going to do? So this presents major problems for people. How am I doing for time? I've got about... How am I doing? I lost my... <laughs> how am I doing off my... Okay, I've got 12 minutes. Perfect. Okay, so the story I want to get to is what have these folks missed? What actually is going on? Um, why is the weak wage growth? And in a sense, what the Fed and the Bank of England and the ECB kind of says is that everything's great, productivity is going to take off, wages are going to take off, all is well. Mm, that's not kind of, that's, I mean, think of the gig economy, think of insecurity, think of hopelessness and populism and all the rest of it. So this is about the fact that there's been very, in reality, none of that's happened. Wage growth has been weak and people are hurting, which is my story. And there's a lot in the book about why people are hurting. Um, it turns out that, I'm just going to go through quickly, um, it turns out, and I, and I will summarize this pretty quickly, and I don't obviously need people to read the chart. So what's happened is that globalization has moved on. Workers feel like they have no strong bargaining power. There's a big, big um, in the UK, four million people from Eastern Europe showed up from 2004 through 2019. So that's had an impact on workers. But the other thing in a place like Italy and elsewhere, firms realize that if, wage, if wages were to rise much, they can move their production to Ireland, to Thailand, to India. So basically what's happened is that labor market slack is much greater than people think. And it turns out that the most important measure that we've been working on is, is actually about underemployment. Uh, and I'll, by underemployment, I mean this. And it's different from unemployment. Unemployment just means you're out of work, right? And it means in the past, the unemployed wanted to get jobs and wanted pay. The higher the amount of unemployment, the, the weaker the bargaining power of workers was. Okay. But the problem in lots of these countries now is the unemployment rate is three and a half and there's still no, no bargaining power. Well, why is that? Turns out since 2008, I'll say it, try and put it simply, um, pay in the past was pushed down at the external margins. It was pushed down by people, unknown people. You have a job, you have a job, but your pay is kept in check because all these people over here you don't know are unemployed. But now what we see in the data is that there's masses of people around the world, true in Italy, true around the world, who say, I'm in a part-time job, and I'd like a full-time job, and I can't get it. And I'm in a part-time job, and I've got 15 hours, but I'd like 25. So that turns out to be the new phenomenon. And I'll just say, what we've seen in the past is something at the external margins has now been turned to the internal margin. Think of the, the people in the gig economy 
people in the gig economy, these people over here are in the gig economy, but they're in the same firm as these people over here, and they're quite aware who they are, and they also know them. You know him, right? So this intensive margin, this internal margin means the gig economy has meant that the pressure's coming from within firms. Um, and my view is, if we were at full employment, we wouldn't see that. Workers would have much more bargaining power, and we'd be able to say, well, I don't want this job. If you don't give me more hours, I'm quitting. And so that's a big indicator. So it turns out, I'll give you another story as well. In the book, I talk about what I call TV Junction. <laughs> and TV Junction is quite interesting, because it happened to me. In 1974, I was a student. Um, and the labor market was hot. And I got hired by um, Tarmac, a construction company. And I got hired at the lowest of the low levels. I was called the chain boy. So I was the boy in, the, in 1850 who would carry the chain to measure things, right? But, I, but I was the guy who worked with a surveyor. And I carried the theodolites and the, set them down. And, anyway, but the point of my story is that the labor market was so tight that for the first time in 50 years, they couldn't get chain boys at chain boy rates. So I was paid full laborers' rates for a chain boy job. My point is that there's the, there's, the, there's the pyramid of jobs, if you like, the job pyramid. And when times were good, I would enter the pyramid higher up than I should have done. You know, I could, I could have been there, you know, if I'd have carried on, I could have taken a PhD in uh, chain carrying. But anyway, but the point of the story now, the underemployment that I see now, and it's around the world, it's not just that people have less hours, it's that people with a degree are doing jobs of people with a high school diploma. People with a high school diploma are doing jobs of people who are high school dropouts. And everybody's pushed down the job pyramid. We see no evidence in any of these countries suddenly that people are now rising up the job pyramid, which is what you would see if you were at full employment. So, um, I want to show you a couple of things. So this is what David Bell and I have done. We've done it for Italy, we've done it for every country. So this is the data that seems to be the most important. So we ask people, and we use the European Labour Force Survey for the technically minded. It's true for every country. I can do it for, I've got it for every country in Europe. I have it in, in the, particularly in the UK. And this is just, we ask people, how many hours are you, this is just for workers, and this is really the big phenomenon. We ask workers, how many hours do you work? And they say, 26. And we say, okay, are you happy with those hours? If not, would you like to change them? Yes. Some people, it turns out, say, I would like to work less hours, right? And some people say, I would like to work more hours. And we can work out how many hours that amounts to. Well, it turns out, so that in the UK, and I've done it for Italy, I'm, but I'm just using this chart because it's nice. It turns out the red line is the total number of hours that you get from people who want to work less. But the big blue line is this line which says, I would like to work more hours. And it turns out this is the really big deal. The unemployment rate doesn't matter, it turns out. This is what matters, because that line, as you see, that's millions of hours. You can translate that into unemployment equivalents. But that line is nowhere near back to where it was at the start. If you've got weak wage pressure, wages haven't gone to where they were in the past. You need a series. You need a series that has that characteristic. And this series uniquely does it in every European country, does it in the UK, does it in the US, and the story is this, even though unemployment is back at very low levels, underemployment isn't. Underemployment is what's driving people, and this is what's hurting people. People are pushed into low-paying jobs, jobs with less hours than they would like, and that's making them unhappy. So you even have poverty out of work, and added to that now, we have poverty and hurt in work. Okay, so let me just... I'm going to stop in a tick. So in, in Italy, we see, so here's the numbers I do for Italy. In countries with high unemployment rates, underemployment adds a little to the top of it. But actually, in places you see like France, I mean, that the amount of, this is, this is, you add underemployment on top of unemployment. And it turns out these numbers are pretty big. Italy, it's not so big, but what you often see is unemployment comes down and underemployment doesn't. Um, so real wages are everywhere are very weak. I just want to get to this, and I want to show you some pictures, and then we're finished. So basically, the, so the, the, the policymakers missed the Great Recession. They're missing everything now. They think we're at full employment. But inconsistent with that would be this. And the book documents it. And it documents it across countries. So an example in the United States is that we've seen this horrible death of despair epidemic. 
Huge 72,000 people last year dying from opioid poisoning and opioid overdoses, driven in part by a need to, to deal with pain. Pain, in the, despite the big rise in opioid prescriptions, pain in the United States is hugely up. And a typical American, even though they take all these things, are much more in pain than anywhere else in the world. A quarter of all visits to a doctor in the United States, someone reports being in chronic pain. I mean, I wouldn't have thought that would be true at full employment. So uh, hopelessness is up, anxiety is up. Um, the death toll from not just um, opioids, but from suicides and, and, drug and, and, and liver poisoning from drinking is up. Doesn't sound like what's happened at full employment. And so there's this gap. I want to just show you a couple of things, and then we can obviously go to questions. And people are really very worried about this, these deaths of despair spreading around the world. In the UK, life expectancy and the US, in the last two years, life expectancy has fallen for the first time in like 50 years. Um, so, but everyone says we're at full employment. I want to show you some plots. So then the question is, what's going on? Does the labor market drive things? And I'm going to show you just some pictures some pictures, and I can do the same for Italy, but I, I, mean, I probably should, but I, I'm just going to show you pictures from the United States, from the UK, and from France. And the question is, who votes for Trump, Brexit, and Le Pen? Okay. Well, the first thing I'm going to show you, this, so this is, I'm not just talking about individuals, I'm going to do it by place. So think of a county, some, the characteristics of a small place. So which counties voted for Le Pen? Which counties voted for Trump? Which counties voted for Brexit? And the answer is the votes are from places that hurt. So the first one here is who voted t to leave based upon the average wage in the county? So the lower the average wage in the county, the more likely it was that people would vote to leave. So now I'll just plot, I'll do a more disaggregated one. Let's do it by ward. So let's take the proportion of people in the ward who have a degree. I mean, look at, I mean, these patterns, you don't, you don't really have to, you don't have to do any econometrics or anything fancy, you could just see it. Okay, so lower levels of education, more likely to vote for Brexit. So now let's go to Trump. And I'm going to show you exactly the same. It's exactly the same by state. So which states voted for Trump? Answer, the states with the lowest wage. Try another one. So this is just to make life easy. Instead of just saying, let's see who voted for Trump, that's dominated by the fact that Trump votes are in certain places. So the simple thing to do is just say, let's take a county, let's see what vote Romney got, and let's see what vote Trump got, and then let's just take one from the other and plot that. Turns out that the higher the Trump-Romney difference, the higher is the unemployment rate. And it turns out that if I show you anything bad, Anything bad will do. So the, the, the shorter life expectancy in the, in, the, in the area, the more likely the vote for, the, for Trump Romney. Um, I can do it by suicide, by heavy drinking rates, by um, uh, obesity rates. It doesn't matter. You just get the same pattern. And then if you do the same in France, that's exactly, you get exactly the same thing. It's positively correlated with the, with the unemployment rate. I'm just going to stop there for a second. The problem with all of this clearly is that economic factors, lack of decent work, has led to these um, issues. There are a couple of problems. I'm just going to. Am I do, can I do three minutes? I think I'm. A couple of problems I'll just go to. So promises have been made, and I want to think about the promises that have been made. I'm going to give you a little story. Promises have been made that you know that Brexit, Trump, whoever the parties in Italy, the promises have been made that they can make life better. So the question is, is that true? And what happens if they don't make things better? And it's clear in the United States things have not been better for those who voted for Trump, but his polling pretty much remained the same. But I want to tell you a story about Luzerne County. So it turns out one of my colleagues comes, he told me this story, he comes from Luzerne County, which is a coal town. Um, and it's, a, it's in Pennsylvania. And it ha it, um, Obama won twice there by about 16 points. Trump went there and said, I'm going to bring coal jobs back to Luzerne County, um, and, he, and won by five points. 
So Luzerne County, I mean, I went, so I went and did some research, and the, my friend told me to go look at this. It turns out that Luzerne County was the center of the Pennsylvania coal mining in the 50s. And then it turns out that the Susquehanna River, the big river through Pennsylvania, changed its course and flooded the mines, and there was a terrible mine disaster. And from about 140,000 miners in the 50s, the numbers have collapsed, as they have in the UK. So I went and started to talk to people at the Luzerne County um, office, and they said, go and look at the website. So I went to the website, and it says, tells the story of coal mining in Luzerne County, and it says, and it was fine until the river changed its course, and this has changed everything to sort of destroyed mining in the area, and it says on the website, there are millions of tons of coal in Luzerne County, none of which is mineable. No, none of which is mineable because it's under a thousand feet of water. So coal jobs aren't coming back. They're certainly not coming back to Luzerne County, even though people think they are. Um, in the UK, um, every sea English seaside town voted to leave apart from the one I was born in, which is Brighton. And the reason that they're hurting is because of Italy and Greece and Spain, because in 1950, in Britain, the coal miners and the steel workers closed for two weeks a year, and they all went to Blackpool. But in 1965, there were cheap aeroplanes that could bring them to Trento, and Blackpool is not going <laughs> to get, Blackpool is not going to get tourists, because, okay, so the last thing, the last thing is look at what the people say. So here's a little story about where we are now and what people say. So this is a series I think is quite interesting. And this suggests to me that things aren't very good and people know. So let me just show you this series. So the red line is the unemployment rate. So the thing particularly to look at is the, obviously the red line in the UK, this is, so unemployment comes down from, um, um, which, uh, yeah, unemployment comes down from around 8%, falls steadily, gets to here around 6%. So here's the unemployment rate gets to 6% and then it falls steadily down to 4 and everybody should be feeling great. The unemployment rate, says the central bank, means everything. But the blue line asks people, how are you feeling? How, how, how are things going? And they say to them, what do you think is going to happen to the unemployment rate in the next 12 months? So it turns out over here, over here, that was pretty good, right? That was pretty darn good. People over here said, I think unemployment is going to rise. So since 2014, despite the fact that the unemployment rate has fallen, for the last two years, everybody says, I think unemployment's going to rise, right? So you, the central bank says everything's great, unemployment's going to fall, and everybody says, nah, it's going to rise. I'm not feeling good because even though the unemployment rate's coming down, I think it's going to go up. So there's this big disconnect I've tried to get to, policymakers, people hurting, the gig economy, people not having significant wage growth, and not being able to move to, big, to good jobs. So the worry is that they've missed it again. So uh, I think unemployment rates are at historic lows. Underemployment has replaced unemployment. But I'm going to finish with a little quote, and I have, the, have two extracts of my book were published by Bloomberg last week. And I'm just going to finish with that and say I'm afraid I don't think much has been learnt in the last 10 years. And I finish with this, we, don't know, we didn't know where we were, we didn't know where we'd been, and we didn't know where we were going, same as now. <laughs> the, the, sorry, the, the, la the last thing I should say, the worry is you came into this room feeling depressed, and you're going to leave feeling worse. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> L'economia non è famosa come scienza dell'allegria, no? Quindi, eh, anzi, devo dire che oggi, <ride> oggi ho, ho avuto la, la prova provata di una frase che ho letto sull'Economist che mi ha sempre interessato, ma che oggi è proprio stata dimostrata nella sua perfetta esattezza. Economist scrisse professore forse lo ricorda che la scienza l'economia è la scienza che studia perché le sue previsioni non si sono avverate è perfetto tutta la prima parte del, del suo discorso è stata 
uh, per, uh, votata a farci vedere che l'economia non vede dove siamo fino a quando è tardi o perlomeno non ci, non, non ci sono gli strumenti per accorgersi in tempo reale della gravità delle situazioni e la seconda cosa che mi sono portato a casa è che c'è una teoria sottostante che eh, eh, dice che certe policy porteranno a dei benefici e quindi vanno adottate e costantemente sono sbagliate e costantemente vengono mantenute quindi in un certo senso eh, tutta la sua prima parte è stata una critica degli esperti una critica del modo con il quale la tecnocrazia legge la realtà e quindi una sorta di giustificazione di chi non gli crede più d'altra parte la seconda parte è stato una osservazione del fatto che sono proprio i fatti reali che sono correlati con il voto diciamo eh, eh, populista non, non so come definirlo per aggregare l'insieme di tutte le cose che ha fatto vedere quindi in effetti la, 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 la prima domanda che mi verrebbe poi il pubblico deve, deve dirci il suo modo di vedere questa presentazione allora, cioè, non hanno tutti i torti questi qua che criticano gli esperti lo chiedo a un esperto come sapete a Creta il cretese disse tutti i cretesi sono mentitori creando il più bel paradosso della storia ma a un esperto chiedere come sono, se hanno ragione quelli che criticano gli esperti cosa ci risponde? I think I take this. Uh, uh, I, 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 well, I, I agree with that. I think what, what I've actually shown you is that if you talk to the real people, certainly if we look at 2007, 8 and 9, ordinary people got it. If you looked at what they said um, and you looked at the evidence, real people were saying that it was hurting. So I was sitting on the committee at the Bank of England and we'd have you know, several hundred economists <coughs> and then we'd have the bank agents, and the economists would say all kinds of stuff, and it was almost exactly the opposite to what the bank's agents were saying. Well, what I mean by that, when I say the bank's agents, all the bank's agents did is they went out and talked to people. They went out and talked to individuals and firms, and they said, this is what the people said. And at the end, I got myself into big trouble, because I said, well, we didn't really need the 600 economists. You should have just listened to the people. And, I, and at one moment I said, well, actually, we'd have been better off if the 600 economists had been delivering pizza. And someone said to me, no, that would have been no good because they'd never have found the right house. <laughs> I think that sort of sums it up. And obviously the chart I showed you at the end suggests that people are not feeling uh, what the central banks are saying. In countries like the US and the UK, there is no wage growth. People are hurting. When you ask them, how are you doing? They say, I'm in pain. I can't sleep, I'm feeling bad, I feel insecure. And, and the central banks and the policy makers have sort of ignored that at their peril. Because the people, I mean, I do think that, the people, I mean, the data that I have, the people got it then and they get it now. And, you, and if, if central bankers keep saying, and elites keep saying, everything's great, that's okay. why we've got populism, because nobody Professor, believes that nonsense. Professor, però, allora, vediamo un attimo. Sono... I, I agree, I, I mean, I'm going to speak in Italian, this is the format. Uh, anyway, um, è vero, quindi, primo, è vero che gli... No, perché mi hanno detto che bisogna parlare in italiano. Il primo è... Um, eh, L'argomento numero uno è che gli esperti, nel senso della teoria convenzionale, ha sbagliato e non si rende... E non, e non, e, ed, è, ed è motivo di delusione. La seconda cosa che vorrei dire, per favore, è che nell'ambito della scienza, e la scienza è fatta in un modo tale per cui poi emergono sempre delle persone, degli scienziati, dei ricercatori che correggono la visione della scienza ed è per questo che noi veniamo volentieri al Festival dell'Economia perché ci sono le persone che raccontano la storia convenzionale ma ci sono sempre anche le persone che innovano la scienza guardandola da un punto di vista diverso come il professore uh, 
Prego. Let me just I, 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 th I think what you said is completely right, but the, what I showed you is that there has been no learning. No learning, but there will be. I mean, yeah. Un'altra un cosa importante, arrivo subito, è che a un certo punto quei dati dell'unemployment in Inghilterra, mentre l'unemployment diminuisce e la gente ha paura dell'unemployment futuro, possono significare che le persone sono preoccupate per motivi reali oppure possono significare che le persone sono pre preoccupate per motivi non reali perché una delle cose che si dicono è si mettono in giro delle notizie false la gente si preoccupa di cose che non sono reali questo è possibile o no? Um, I, I, I think the perception is right I guess a, a statistic I should give you is that um, I had a conversation two days ago on Twitter with a guy called Rupert Harrison, who was the chief advisor to the economic minister in the UK. And he said, economic miracle, employment is higher than it's, you know, it's been in the past, everything's wonderful. And I said, hmm, real wages today are 6% lower in the UK than they were in 2008. So that means, just think, what does that mean? It just means my pay packet would buy stuff in 2008. Today, my pay packet buys 6% less than I could buy in 2008. We expect over time real wages to rise. So the answer is, the policy maker says everything's great and you say, but I'm worse off than I was 11 years ago. There's the disconnect. And I think that the people are right because real wages are down 6%. And actually, they're falling. They're, they were 5% um, below four months ago. So not only are they lower, it's actually getting worse. So, so there's the disconnect. And I, and I believe the people, <laughs> I believe the people are right. That there's this, it's not an economic miracle, it's a disaster. And it turns out in the UK that the, everyone says what a great recovery it's been. I, I wrote a column which said, I've actually looked at the data. We now have data for 600 years. In the UK, it turns out, this is the third slowest recovery ever. The slowest was the Black Death 600 years ago. <laughs> Um, and the next one, the next slowest, was the South Sea bubble 300 years ago. So we're now, I mean, so policymakers want to tell you everything's great. You, this is the worst recovery in 300 years. Sorry, what have I done? Abbiamo le domande dal pubblico per piacere. Sorry. Una, okay. due, tre. Okay. Devo parlare in... Si sente? Ah, sì. English or Italian? In Italian, English. So, uh, thank you, Professor. Um, so, you, you were showing the um, table from the Fed, and you were showing that they're um, um, thinking that uh, rates uh, will uh, rise, uh, despite the opinion of the markets. So, um, my question was, do you think they are um, either stupid or <laughs> They are um, great dreamers, or maybe they are great economists. So, uh, and by the way, you are. <laughs> so uh, maybe um, you you gave me the answer, but I would like to listen also to the answer from the professor. So you were saying that maybe they are trying to fight uh, some pessimism or. Um, fake news, so they are trying to um, uh, say accendere la miccia, so um, to make things, uh, things um, to make the economy start uh, starting uh, running again, so yeah. It's a very great question. Um, um, I, I was on a committee, when I, was on, when I was on the Bank of England, there were nine people and me. And it turns out that the vote was always one against eight. And it took me a very long time to realize that actually there were two opinions. Eight of them had the same opinion, and me. And there were two opinions. So the first one was the tyranny of the consensus, which was a very big deal. Um, I also think that we've now in it put ourselves in a position that um, Paul de Graw said it very well. Um, he said that many of these people are, their memory is inflation in 1974. 
and he thinks that the tools of the central bank is essentially um, the economics of the Maginot line. Right, the line of defenses that was okay for the First World War, but it was irrelevant in the second. Um, I don't know whether the answer is that they're stupid. Um, I, I, it's consistent with that as an explanation. Let me say that. I'm not going to say it, but that's consistent. I mean, especially when I show you no learning, right? I show you no learning and that, I mean, in, on my committee in August 2008 and uh, July 2008, people were voting for rate rises. And in, in, in the minutes of the committee meeting in September 2008, I voted for a 50 basis point cut, and I said the world is collapsing around the floor, and I got about that much in the minutes, and there's about two and a half pages about why we should raise rates. So the answer is that, um, I mean, phrases like tyranny of the consensus, um, sticking with old stories and not learning. Um, the book is about, can I tell you a little story? I may, it may be, it's, I, my, my editor was kind of worried. So I went, <laughs> this may be the answer, but I'm not going to quite say it. I went to a meeting in Newfoundland of what was called the American Learned Societies. So I went to the meeting and a taxi driver picked me up and I said, I want to go to what they call the Learneds. And he said, hmm, yep, the Learneds have been here all week and the locals have re redefined their name. I said, well, we said, we don't call them the learned. I said, well, what do you call them? He said, the stupids. Is that, is that a good answer? <laughs> That's my best I can do. <laughs> Someone, somebody, si, sorry. Si, uh, wave. Oh, there you go. Uh, scusi se comunque sia utilizzo l'italiano, purtroppo sono argomenti piuttosto difficili eh, su cui lessico non sono molto preparato, ma mh, la ringrazio comunque per il taglio che ha dato alla presentazione che ho molto apprezzato, piuttosto tecnico e su cui tra l'altro c'è poco da discutere, cioè perlomeno su alcuni di quei dati. E volevo però fare un appunto che riguarda perlomeno il momento iniziale della crisi, quello che è la miccia che poi è andata a innescare la bomba, quella del processo di eventi, la serie di eventi che poi ha portato al fallimento di Bear Stearns. E, ehm, Bear Stearns, una banca, credo. E quindi mi chiedo se eh, da lì non è cambiato nulla, cioè i cosiddetti CDO, eh, si è semplicemente cominciato a chiamarli Bespoke Transition Opportunity, semplicemente un altro nome per camuffare valori che in realtà non rispecchiano quelli reali quindi c'è sì chi eh, non ha visto chi ha sbagliato ma chi non ha voluto vedere e chi ha voluto sbagliare per eh, insomma tutelare degli interessi che non sono quelli dei cittadini che non sono i nostri e non sono quelli dei cittadini europei che è poi credo anche il problema di questa Unione Europea che è sbilanciata anche alla tutela di interessi che non sono quelli nostri. E quindi mi chiedo, se non è cambiato nulla, allora il problema è ben più grave di previsioni che sono diventate, sono poco, che rispecchiano poco la realtà. È un problema di un sistema che è volto a frodare sostanzialmente le, la gente comune. Grazie, molto bene, grazie. Um, uh, uh. I, I, I think you're right that we have somewhat changed. Um, let me just explain. So I sat on a committee that actually watched, I mean, the, when the governor of the Bank of England actually had no idea that there was a great recession coming, also had no idea that Northern Rock was actually going to fail. And the first time in 100 years in the, in the UK, we had thousands of people standing outside banks So that was about two years before the failure of RBS, and then three weeks after that, the failure of Lloyd's. Um, obviously, we've tried, uh, and we didn't learn from the fact that the, um, the Great Recession started in the Florida housing market. Sorry, the Great Depression started in the Florida housing market, and pretty much so did the, the Great Recession. Obviously, we've tried to adjust and improve um, bank balance sheets and so on. But I think the big issue, I mentioned it before, is that um, policymakers don't have any weapons left 
and it's and your point is well taken it's hard to believe that for example could the british government do anything well the british government couldn't do anything about anything at the moment i mean they don't there's, there's not a credible government anymore so the concern is central banks don't have any firepower maybe things are a little better than they were but when this shock comes um it doesn't look that um we have any weaponry to deal with it and the last thing i would say the markets are probably going to crash more than they did before this is my pet thesis because in the past people realized that central banks could cut rates can't do that so what's the only tool that central banks have got more quantitative easing so that means you know that if the markets crash then the central banks are going to come in do quantitative easing and raise equity values so that suggests that the decline might well be greater than it was in the past because you know that the central bank is going to step in so i i agree with you i don't think we've learned that much and my concern is that because there's been no learning and the, and the central bank has just looked completely clueless maybe stupid um it's a big worry i, I agree with that i'm sorry oh my god <laughs> Abbiamo ancora uh, 3-4 domande, vi prego di stare sintetici. Il Mol signor... Molto sintetico, cioè lei ci ha spiegato eh, che una classe dirigente ha fatto fallimento, credo, nel senso che eh, ci ha raccontato delle cose e se ne sono verificate delle altre. La mia domanda è questa, al di là del tema degli esperti, ma quello che ci è successo, in che misura... Eh, va letto eh, collegandolo a una trasformazione molto più ampia di che è successo nel, nel pianeta Terra cioè faccio parte di una generazione che negli anni 70 aveva capito che il 20% della popolazione consumava l'80% delle risorse l'anno scorso Richard Baldwin qui ci ha detto che quel 20% consuma meno del 50% delle risorse e che in Asia 2 miliardi di persone sono usciti dal livello della miseria della povertà assoluta e mi sembra che allora ritornando alla domanda delle origini di, eh, della crisi c'è eh, ecco c'è qualche cosa di più ampio di quello che ci c'è successo e in termini di capire che cosa ci succederà ancora come ci dobbiamo attrezzare per stare in un mondo fatto molto diverso Um, yeah, I think the world's changed. I think that particularly in the U.S., um, we've seen this enormous rise in, in, in income inequality and especially in wealth inequality. Um, my old friend who actually recently passed, Alan Kruger, has a new book out talks called Rockonomics, and it talks about how the music industry is much like the world in that sales of stuff has stopped. You, they're not selling music. And basically what they're doing is selling um, tours, but superstars dominate everything, right? So the superstar rock band takes 95% of the, of the income. And so the, I think the evidence is that rising inequality, both of income and of wealth, but then think about what the central banks did. Central banks stepped in to rescue homeowners um, and rescue those who held assets. Young people neither had homes nor assets. So the, the central bank stepped in and, and no, none of the people who basically caused the crisis went to jail. So I think it's that rising inequality, particularly wealth inequality. I'm trying to find the chart that I have. I can't remember where I put it. There's a chart which shows the, pr the proportion of wealth held by um, the top 0.1%. Um, is equal to that of held by the bottom 90%. And that was only true in the 1920s. And that gap, there was a huge gap between them for the last 75 years. And now we're back to the levels of inequality that were true in the 20s. And I think relative things matter. So I do think our generation, um, I mean, what we saw in the 70s and 80s, we saw a rise of unions. We see narrowing of equality, so, you know, less inequality than in the past. So inequality um, is important, and I've written about stuff in happiness economics, and what we've learned there is relative things matter. If I get a BMW and you don't, it makes me happy. But if I get a BMW and you get one, that doesn't make me happy. I'm just as happy as I was before. Relative things matter. Um, 
Io ero curioso di sapere eh, per la prossima eh, crisi che siamo tutti d'accordo ci sarà e sarà molto forte, però nel, mh, il consenso eh, in questo caso è ci sarà una crisi, a differenza delle altre volte, nell'87, nel 2001, nel 2008 non c'era consenso, erano tutti convinti, stiamo andando benissimo e al, in un momento improvviso c'è il crash dei mercati e il disastro, mentre adesso sono tutti d'accordo, ci sarà una crisi, sarà una crisi, ma non c'è mai la crisi. E volevo capire, ci sono delle cause, perché prima si diceva, ma forse i debiti pubblici, ma l'unico debito pubblico in questo momento, sotto, veramente sotto la luce di ingrandimento, è il debito pubblico italiano. Quale potrebbe essere la prossima causa, il debito pubblico italiano? E poi, la seconda parte della domanda, perché le banche centrali non avrebbero più le munizioni? Perché possono tranquillamente comprare bond, equities, quindi più che quantitative easing, certo non possono più diminuire gli interessi anche se possono andare neg negativi, ma potrebbero comprare tranquillamente i bond, bond corporate, bond statali, quindi il loro, finché c'è fiducia nel dollaro e nell'euro, cioè finché l'euro e il dollaro sono l'ultimo diciamo, asset, cioè prima del crollo totale è la Federal Reserve che deve crollare, in quel caso andiamo nel baratto, quindi barter, io sono convinto che le banche centrali possano tranquillamente risolvere un'altra crisi. Grazie. Non so cosa dire sulla prima Let me just spend a little time thinking about the second question. Um, I, I sat at the central bank and by November 2008 it was quite clear that we were going to have to do quantitative easing, right? Um, and we had no idea how to do it. So the reality was, I can tell you what the discussions in the room were, and it was the same at the ECB and the, and the, the Fed. We had no idea how to do it. We had no idea what to buy. We had no idea what units of observation were. I mean, what, what, how much should you buy? No idea. The other thing we didn't know was, well, what would it do? Right? So sh if you, want, you say, okay, we want to buy treasuries, or we want to buy gilts, we'll call it, well, which ones do you buy? Do you buy three-year gilts? Do you buy 10? Do you buy 30? Well, it turned out that, um, that we just did not know. We also don't know, we had no idea what to do as you come out of the crisis. So the answer is you're living in a world of I don't know. Um, the problem, it turns out, well, the first problem for the United States is the Fed Has, uh, can only buy three things, so if you know this. I actually know this. I was in Ben Bernanke's office and he t at the Fed and he told me this. So the Fed is restricted to only buy three things. It can only buy federally insured assets. So that means treasuries, it means mortgage-backed securities, which it has done, and it also means short-term municipal bonds, which it's never done. But the Fed explicitly is not allowed to buy ETFs, anything. The discussion, and I agree with what you said, that's going to limit the Fed because obviously the question is, well, what do you buy now? And if, you can't, if the stuff that's had the biggest effects already been bought, it means maybe the marginal effect as you go down, as you get bigger, is, is smaller. So we were told, and I think this is probably right, the central bank, as part of its quantitative easing program, could buy anything. So I think I could buy a company. The danger would be if I buy the company and then the company goes bust, people would say it's an unmandated fiscal policy. But in principle, and this may well be where we're going to go, because we've seen the ECB and the Bank of Japan broaden what it buys. I mean, the Bank of England bought, which is quite interesting, the Bank of England at its last go-round bought private sector bonds of companies that made a significant contribution to the UK economy. Half of those companies were American firms. <laughs> So the, U the U.S. is not buying corporate American corporates, but the Bank of England is buying American corporates. The ECB could buy American corporates. Could buy Amer I mean, so the answer is that we just don't know. The potential is that they're going to have to go and buy all sorts of things, which is back to my earlier point. This is going to be very positive to equities after the crash that comes, right? Um, but the search is going to be on on what to buy. So for investors, that's going to be a positive. But for people who don't have assets, who've lost their houses and all that stuff, I mean, think of people, think of student loan debt. I mean, one obvious thing that central banks might want to do around the world is actually start to buy student debt. I mean, which in the UK, I think the, the government's borrowing at whatever is one, and it's charging students six. 
Well, we're going to see students defaulting. <laughs> so, I, I mean, your question's a great one. This is going to be a big problem, but the Fed is stuck. And we don't even know either whether the Fed could go negative. And we don't know whether the Bank of England could go negative either. So this is really where we're going, and the worry is that, to put it technically, we're all screwed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good question. Two more questions. Una qui. Io voglio fare una considerazione sul fatto che noi abbiamo una perversione del termine economia che deriva da oikonomos, la cura della casa, e vengo a chiamare anche in causa Greta, no? Quando parliamo della cura della casa, noi a un certo punto abbiamo un'idea perversa dell'economia. L'altro tema è uno storico e economista, Carlo Cipolla, ha scritto la teoria della stupidità. Quando le percentuali, e sono tre paginette, è una tesi interessante, quando la, la percentuale di stupidità in una società supera il livello di soglia, quella società va in crescita, ma sta andando in crescita il, il pianeta. Allora il problema è, ieri Giovannini ci ha illustrato il test, il, il, le, rizze, le statistiche di competenza dell'Ocse. E ho capito che gli italiani, eh, un livello di competenza per vivere in questa, in questa società è 5. Gli italiani e i greci hanno 0,7 ed è un livello di sopravvivenza che non ci possiamo permettere allora io metto insieme che il fatto che non, non bisogna mettersi il giubbotto giallo e andare a protestare o a fare le proteste senza avere la competenza di quali sono le soluzioni quindi secondo me, tornando a Oikonomos, ognuno di noi deve mettersi davanti allo specchio misurarsi il livello di stupidità perché noi pensiamo sempre che la stupidità è nei politici e nei, negli no, Salvemi gli diceva i politici, il 10% dei politici è migliore della società, il 10% è peggiore, l'80% è uguale alla società, ma se una società la percentuale di stupidità è quello 0,7 dei greci e degli italiani la dice tutta. Grazie. Vogliamo sentire anche la sua? Eh sì, anche... Funziona? Sì, è, è forse collegata. Dunque abbiamo ehm, ascoltato quindi economisti che prevedono il futuro sbagliando clamorosamente, popolazione che tutto sommato fa previsioni migliori e quindi non quindi, e contestualmente un'ascesa del populismo che sembra spiegare un pochino questa equazione e che sembra essere la speranza del popolo di avere soluzioni migliori, però appunto soluzioni... Eh, nel, nell'economista, nel popolo né tantomeno questi governi populisti ne trovano in realtà alcuni governi del passato in Italia, in, forse anche in Inghilterra insomma alcuni governi hanno tentato di applicare alcune ricette proposte da economisti o da esperti magari sbagliando ma con un'idea precisa di futuro il populismo sembra essere tutto sommato un una, una forza politica nelle mani fa un fantoccio, un nulla nelle mani di, ancora più nelle mani di chi riesce invece a manovrare e a beneficiare di crisi o, o situazioni che poi la popolazione tutto sommato paga. Insomma, non è che ci lasci molto speranza, spero in una parola di speranza. Una domanda lì? Pronto? Eh, volevo capire che vincoli diversi ci sono. Ok. Sorry, can you start? I just didn't hear sì, it sì. again. Sorry, thank you. Volevo capire i vincoli diversi che ci sono per le nazioni che appartengono all'area euro rispetto a quelle che non appartengono all'area euro e quindi l'Inghilterra in questo caso. Ok, okay direi che abbiamo I... finito, le, quindi questo è l'ultimo remark prima di... Uh, delle parole di speranza che speriamo non siano solo andiamo a pescare. Oh, I missed that. Sorry. I'm going fishing. Do I get to respond? Can I respond? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, um, obviously, care of our homes is an important one. Um, I, I, I think a good illustration is the debate about your idea of not taking care of a home. In a sense, is how desperate people have come. Let's just give a couple of things. So the Brexit party that actually did very well in the European elections last week had no manifesto had no policies whatsoever, didn't have a manifesto. They basically got elected because they said, we want to leave the European Union. Okay, so yesterday they were top of the polls, 
but they literally have no policies. None. I mean, they don't even have a manifest. It's not like I disagree with it. They just don't have any, right? Uh, and then the craziness. So the, pol the, the politicians are all fighting about um, what, who can be most, like, no deal, bre hard Brexit. Um, I just want to sort of illustrate a couple of things to you. Um, it turns out that the UK, got the UK national, the Minister of the Health Service has become the world's biggest buyer of freezers and fridges. Why? Because when the border closes on Halloween, medicines from Italy, medicines from Spain, medicines from France can't cross the border, so they have to stockpile. And the only way that the National Health Service can stockpile is buy all the world's fridges freezers and fr to stockpile the medicines. Great. But I have a better one which I will finish on. It turns out that um, no, no deal Brexit means basically that the borders will close. And it means there's going to be 30 mile lines of trucks sitting at the borders, particularly at Dover. And I think this illustrates your example very well. It turns out that the UK has not just become the world's biggest buyer of fridges. You know, I want to see what the Italian translation for this is. It's also become the world's biggest buyer of porta potties, portable toilets. Porta potties. What do you call? What's the Italian for porta potty? Okay, you've got to see. You've got to listen to me. This is how stupid. You know, a portable toilet. And the reason is that if you have a 30-mile line, according to the laws in Europe and in, and the laws in Europe, which is that if the if, if drivers are sitting in trucks for two days in a line to go across to Dover, you have to have a porta potty every 250 yards along the freeway. So what no Brexit means is lots of porta potties. How did I do? Perfect. Take care of your home. <laughs> Stupid, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, beh, insomma, per vedere il resto della storia degli, degli esperti e della difesa degli esperti, Michael Spence e eh, l'Istituto per la Nuova Visione Economica oggi alle 2, il premio Nobel eh, Michael Spence discuterà di questo con eh, il direttore dell'Istituto Soros. Uh, sponsorizzato da Soros che guarda una nuova economia nata nel 2008 mi sa che conviene proprio vedere la continuità di questi due episodi grazie molto di essere stati qui con noi Thank you.